Good morning. It's lovely to see you. It says in the Bible, see I'm doing a new thing. I don't know whether God had in mind TBC starting a service at 10.30 rather than 10.35, but we're going to give it a go. So good morning. Welcome. Great to see you all. Welcome. Welcome to those of you who are here in the building. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online. It's great to have you with us as well. Uh, it's great to see you all this morning. Um, my name's Paul. I'm one of the ministers here. And um, if I don't yet know your name, then I'd love to get to know it. We, uh, we try to be a family here. We don't want to just be a place where a bunch of Christians gather We want TBC to be a Christian family where we know one another. And so if you are new or fairly new to TBC, I'd love it if you would fill in one of these forms. We call them connect forms, mainly because it's got the word connect in large letters on the front. Um, And it's somewhere that you can put your name, you can put uh, a mobile number or an email address or some other thing. And um, it's a way that we can get in touch with you because that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to get to know you. When you first come to a church, it's a very natural thing that you're on the fringe of the church, you're on the edge of the church, but we don't want anyone to stay on the edge of the church. So please, if you're, if you're new or newish, please fill one of these in. You can go to our website, uh, which you can see on the screen there, and that button at the top left, the yellow one, sorry, the bottom left, really, Um, the top left of all the buttons, that's exactly the same as this, and you can do the same thing online, and we'll get in touch with you, uh, because we would love to to get to know you. This morning's service is going to take a slightly different form from a usual Sunday morning service, and I'm giving you advance warning now so that it doesn't come as a huge shock later on. We're going to do all the normal things that we do on a Sunday, but we're going to do them in a slightly shorter time, And then a bit later on, probably around about 11.30, we're going to have an extended time of prayer because we are starting a season of prayer thinking about whether God is telling us to have a building project here. So I'll explain how that's going to work later on, but the normal service is going to be slightly compressed, but then the service is going to continue. That's not the end. Please don't go home. Um, We're going to spend some time praying together about the possibility of a building project. So it's great to see you. I wonder, I wonder, do you know how loved you are this morning? Do you know, I don't mean no, I mean do you know how loved you are this morning? Let me read you a couple of verses. This is from Romans chapter 8, but it's in the message translation, so it's slightly different from the words you might be familiar with. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble. Not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. None of those things. None of those things can drive a wedge between you and God's love for you this morning. I'm going to read that again in a moment. But just think through the week you've had. You you might have had some trouble this week. I suspect most of us have had some trouble this week. You might have had, or you might be having, hard times in one way or another. You might be hungry. You might be... Physically hungry, or you might be hungry for some other thing in life. If you're under under the age of 15, you're probably permanently hungry. I don't know whether anybody here is homeless, but there are ways in which we can feel rootless sometimes, aren't there? Some of us 
might have had bullying threats during the course of the week. That might have happened at school. might have happened at work. might even have happened at home. Some of us might feel like we've been backstabbed during the week. Somebody might have let us down. Somebody we relied on might, have, might not have treated us right. Some of us might just be very aware that we haven't lived this way the way God would have liked us to. But it says, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. Let me read that again. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble. Not hard times. Not hatred. Not hunger. Not homelessness. Not bullying threats. Not backstabbing. Not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. Nothing can come between us and the love that Jesus Christ and God our Father has for us. Let's pray and then we're going to sing. Lord, thank you so much that those words are true. And whether we feel it or not, we are here loved by you accepted by you, wanted by you. And Lord, we want to celebrate that fact together. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Good, good morning. Uh, please stand if you are willing and able. Higher than the mountains that I face, trusted in the trial of Sorry. Constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains. One. Never fails, never gives up, 
never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident you're covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. In death, in death. Fantastic. Grab a seat, please. As your doing the different things you do in your groups. And at coffee time, I would love it if you would come back and tell me what new thing you've learned or what God said to you this morning. Would you do that? They're all sitting there going, no. I'm just going to eat biscuits. I'd love it if you would come back and tell me. Let's pray for you before you go. Father, I want to pray that our children, our young people and their leaders will have the most fantastic time over the next little while as they focus on you and learn new things about you, talk together about who you are and what you're like. And I pray that for each and every one of them, there would be something new from you for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful time, you guys. And we're going to carry on worshipping in here through song. So I'm going to hand back to Simon. Again, please stand if you're willing and able. <laughs> A few songs of worship now together. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and Glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. Be set free. Oh, Jesus, I 
sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never fading. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior. Savior, he can do 
joy and happiness where we give you the glory and our anchor in the times when, when life is tough in your name, Amen Great to see you here and, uh, and online too. Um, I was in primary school. My friend had been asked to do a Bible reading at the carol service. The moment came for her to stand up and she couldn't do it. And she started to cry. And I didn't know what to do. It felt wrong to take the reading from her and stand up and do it, but I couldn't comfort her either. I just sat there next to her, uh, feeling completely useless. When I got home, my mum said to me, maybe you could have stood with her. And at the age of about six, I was introduced to the idea of what advocacy means. Advocacy is the final area of justice we're going to look at this morning in our series on, uh, on justice. And a formal definition of advocacy says it means getting support from another person to help you express your views and wishes and to help you stand up for your rights. But there in that school setting, I was introduced to the idea of simply standing with somebody that didn't have the courage to stand by themselves. And this is a biblical principle. We're going to look at just a verse or two from, Pro from Proverbs 31. Uh, if you've got a Bible, it's on page 668. And the Bible just puts advocacy really simply. Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. The Bible tells us to speak up for the voiceless, for those who cannot help themselves, for the vulnerable, to help those who are in trouble. And I wonder when you last felt voiceless or powerless. Vulnerable, maybe because you're not that good at using a phone or a computer, maybe. Or perhaps at your wit's end because you're being pushed from pillar to post because you just don't understand the way a particular system works. Or maybe you've been, um, you felt vulnerable because you've not been taken seriously because you're just not able to articulate what it is that you want to say. Or worse still, you were judged by the way you were dressed or the colour of your skin, or your gender. At work, or at college, or at school, where you live, or even here at church, when was the last time you longed to have somebody to stand up 
and to speak with you, to speak up for you, to present your case, to be there on your behalf. Because you see, if we've ever felt this, if we've ever felt that powerlessness, that vulnerability, we've had that longing for somebody to be there with us, maybe, maybe that experience will birth, has birthed a compassion for others who feel the same. Maybe it will or has become a compulsion to come alongside others in an advocacy role. Some of us follow the uh, 24-7 uh, Lectio um, um, prayer app. And back on the 9th of April, there was a morning prayer featuring the life of pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. His story is that as Hitler rose to power in Europe, Bonhoeffer loudly and uh, defiantly spoke out against him. Bonhoeffer was forbidden from teaching publicly. He was arrested and he was imprisoned in 1943, where he continued to do some teaching until he was moved to the Flossenburg concentration camp. Flossenburg, he was condemned to death without witnesses, no record of proceedings or a defence. He was executed at the age of 39, just one month before the end of the Second World War in Europe. Why on earth did he do what he did? Maybe this, which he wrote, explains why he stood up and was even killed for his words. When a madman is tearing through the streets in a car, I can, as a pastor who happens to be on the scene, do more than merely console or bury those who have just been run over. I must jump in front of the car and stop it. What he's saying is, it's one thing to console, but sometimes we must confront. It's one thing to agree privately that something is unjust, but sometimes we have to own our convictions and speak out publicly or act in some kind of more personal way. If we want to grow more like Jesus, we must be willing to confront inequalities and injustice around us, just as Jesus did. Like Bonhoeffer, we have to come to understand that faith and action need to go hand in hand. Standing by silently when we see exploitation or oppression or things that are just not fair, it's not an option. It's not an indulgence that we can afford. Lectio contributor Jill uh, Weber, uh, Weber commented, the challenge here by Bonhoeffer is a profound one, not only for every pastor, but for every Christian disciple. Advocacy is found in the book of Exodus. Moses complained to God that he couldn't speak well enough when God said, go to Pharaoh and fight for the Israelites. And so God brought his brother Aaron alongside to speak for him. Advocacy is found in the book of Esther. Mordecai asks his niece Esther to use her position as queen to fight for the Jews. Esther's husband, who is the king, doesn't know that she's a Jew. And when one of the king's officials hatches a plot to have all the Jews killed, Mordecai employs, implores her to petition the king to stop this atrocity. Mordecai says to her, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. This action on Esther's part where she stood up for her people put her in terrible danger. But despite her fear, Esther rose to the challenge and her people are saved. Advocacy is found in the book of Nehemiah, another Old Testament character. He's cupbearer to the king. Historically, he lived at a time when most of God's people had been captured and forced to leave the kingdom of Judah. And when Nehemiah hears the story 
that those living in the land of Judah are in great distress and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the city he is in ruins, he asks the king if he can take some leave and go and rebuild the walls. He tells the king why it matters. He tells the king how the king can help. And the king says yes. And the king gives Nehemiah what he needs. And advocacy is found in the book of Philemon. It's a teeny tiny book in the New Testament. Turn two pages over together and you could miss it. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, gets to know a runaway slave called Onesimus. We don't know what went wrong between Onesimus and his master Philemon. But Paul uses every strategy he can to encourage Philemon, who's a Christian, to take his now new Christian, his now Christian slave, Onesimus, back and welcome him in the way that Philemon might welcome Paul. Standing in the gap, Paul pleads, I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would like to have kept him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Paul appeals to Philemon's faith to convince him to do the right thing. Thing. It's a beautiful example of somebody using their influence on behalf of somebody else. Advocacy always looks like love for another person, and it affirms their life. We learn this perhaps best by understanding the role of the one that Jesus calls the advocate the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us that he is our comforter. He's our counselor to come and stand with us and within us as we face the world around us. This Holy Spirit advocate pushes us along with words of encouragement. Go on, go on, you can do it. The Holy Spirit advocate stands alongside us to remind us all that Jesus has said and to teach us how through Jesus we can live a life in freedom and in wholeness. The Holy Spirit's role is to give us the power to act as we come alongside others and we speak up as their advocate. And often, the opportunity to be an advocate comes about through our gifts and through our experiences, through our passions and through our skills. So back in Kent, a neighbour of ours thought she was going to be dismissed. And I attended a disciplinary meeting. She kept her job. Another person was reeling from a dismissal. And reviewing the paperwork, I was able to help them understand that they hadn't been unfairly dismissed. There are so many stories over the years that I could tell of being that advocate alongside people and seeing a change in the outcome, in their understanding or in, in the actual fear that they have faced. And that's because I've got a background in HR, but I wonder what your background is, what your skills are, what your experience is, how you can use who you are to stand alongside others and support them. So in our cafe, we've written letters to support housing moves. We've supported parents battling for help with their children's education and development, even attending tribunal panels where appropriate. In Frontline, so much of the work that goes on there is advocacy, speaking up for a client and negotiating a fair situation in their circumstances. But advocacy could be as simple as accompanying a friend to a medical appointment, a friend who's frightened, who won't be able to hear well by themselves. And so we go, and we are their ears and maybe their voice 
with them. Or maybe it's helping somebody through horrendous paperwork from an insurance company, or simply sitting in the room while somebody is on the phone to, um, to someone that they feel intimidated by. Advocacy is about using our influence to improve the life of another person by standing with them and speaking up for them. And whether we feel skilled or qualified, the basic gift we can offer is listening and allowing ourselves to feel that injustice and then praying for discernment, for wisdom, and the means to encourage without being pushy or opinionated. Advocacy is not getting what we think the outcome should be. It's about helping somebody who needs that support to get the outcome that they would like to see. Above all, it's holding before God a right understanding of advocacy, which is aiding someone to come to their own decision and fulfill um, in, in the fullness of, of time. Not taking over their life, not doing everything for them, not making decisions for them, but being there and journeying with them until they get to where it is they'd like to go. Advocacy isn't about reinforcing somebody's feelings of helplessness. Well, you should have done it this way, or you should be doing it like that. That's not advocacy. That's condemnation and criticism. Advocacy is about helping others to help themselves get to the place that they need or want to be. It's about building confidence in somebody. You can do it because you're not alone. It's building that confidence so that people can learn how to help themselves. It might include providing the resources or the help for someone to make good. But the big challenge and the big question is what skills, what experience, what passion, what heart do you hold for those that are less empowered to speak for themselves? Advocacy is putting faith into action. Advocacy is speaking up. It's standing up. It's getting our hands dirty. It's being willing to invest time. It's being willing to, to, to feel the pain of those that aren't able to do something for themselves. And it builds patience because people don't always get it right straight away. But our role as an advocate is to help somebody experience the fullness of justice here on earth. So we stand in the gap for people. We stand in the mess. We stand alongside. We speak up. We speak out. We speak with. We listen to. We ask questions. We are fully present. And we are there. So if I were to say... Um, if you will pray for people who are facing injustice, would you stand up? I would expect to see all of us standing because we can all pray and praying is really, really important. But what if I was to ask you to stand up if you're willing to stand up for people? You see, that's what I'm going to ask you to do. Because faith goes with action. Sometimes we have to jump into the mess with people and we get out of that mess together. And it is a thrilling thing. So what skills do you have? What experience do you have? What 
compassion do you have? How can we help people? I'm going to ask us to... Um, um, I'm not going to ask us to close our eyes and stand up because I know that sometimes for those of us that are older, uh, it means that we wobble and we fall over and I don't want anyone to do that. What I'm going to ask you to do is bend your head so that we feel that we can respond relatively privately. I think that's a bit safer. But I'm going to ask, are you willing to stand up for others when you see injustice happening? And if you're not able to stand up or you don't feel confident to stand up, um, I'm going to ask you to raise a hand. Advocacy is something biblical. Advocacy is something beautiful. Advocacy is something that I believe that God calls us to do. So can I invite you to stand if you believe you can be an advocate to those around you. In your workplace, in your school, in your college, here at church, in the ministries that you're involved with. Let's stand. Father God, we thank you. When we have felt vulnerable, we thank you that not only you have stood with us, but you have sent people to stand alongside us. And Father, we stand today as a way of saying thank you. And we want to offer back to you what others have done for us before. And God, maybe there are times when we have felt powerless and we felt vulnerable and we had wished somebody was there to stand with us. But they didn't. But nevertheless, you were still there. And you have placed in us a desire that no one else should feel the way we once felt. Father, would you give us opportunity to stand, to speak, to listen, to put our faith in action, to be people that are vocal in seeing injustices and calling for something better? Father, would you empower us to be people that can stand and say, no, enough is enough. Lord, would you fill us with love so that our hearts break when we see people exploited and oppressed and being treated just plain wrong. Lord, would you seal in us today our response and might we have opportunity to put what we've promised before you today into practice tomorrow and in the tomorrows that are to come. Amen. Do grab a seat. <coughs> Thanks, Astrid. Um, as I said at the beginning of the service, we're going to do things slightly differently this morning, and we're going to spend some time between now and the end of the service praying together um, about the possibility of doing a building project here, about the possibility of extending our church buildings. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to explain uh, why. Um, and to explain some of the thinking and some of the things that I'm hoping that you'll pray about. It's, I think, an exciting time to be part of TBC. God's doing a lot of things at TBC, isn't he? There's, there's some exciting things going on. He's, he's being good to us in all, all sorts of ways. And some of the things that God is doing here are potentially being constrained by the buildings that we've got. There would, there would be more scope for more ministry to happen if the buildings were extended in some ways. And that's why we have been starting this process of thinking about extending the buildings. And uh, it's why 
we have um, got to a point where we, we as a leadership team have said we need to take some time to pray together as a whole church about this. This isn't, something, this isn't a decision that can be taken by a few. It certainly isn't a decision that can be taken by a leadership team. Actually, it's not a decision that I'm comfortable being taken by that subset of the church family who come to all the church meetings. Because not everybody is able to, not everybody chooses to, but this needs to be a decision that involves all of us as a whole church family. And that includes those of you watching at home. You're not excluded from this, and I hope that you'll be praying with us over the next few minutes. We are thinking about the possibility of extending the building in a number of different ways. And all of this is still very much at the, uh, the early stage of thinking and praying through. But we could add some space at the end of the toilet corridor. So if you go down past the toilets to the end there, where the, sort of an, uh, the, the building comes in a bit, we could add some space there that would immensely increase the storage that's available to the Parker Hall, which would mean that a lot of that stuff that is in the Parker Hall that stops the Parker Hall being very usable could be put into a storage space and make that room a lot more usable. We could extend the kitchen and make the kitchen a larger space, which would obviously increase what we can do in terms of catering and those facilities. We could, I'm talk, starting with the exciting ones, have you noticed? We could extend the toilets because... Actually, there's not quite enough toilet space for the number of people that are coming through the building, and so there's ways that we could do that. Now let's go on to the more exciting and interesting ones. We could knock down the current Sussex room, is what we call it, which is, at the moment, 50% storage for um, the food hub and 50% the frontline office. We could take that down, um, which would give us the space to create a purpose-built cafe space um, and also then an upstairs space above that bit of the building, so sort of just the other side of that wall there. Um, and if we went up a story there, we could, re we could build a new Sussex room that could actually be a meeting room and a frontline office up there. There's other places in the building where we can create the food hub storage because we don't want that to be upstairs. We could create a new, another new meeting room up in that upstairs space, some office space and some storage space. So there's all sorts of possibilities there. We could also remove the old platform and do something different about having a baptistry to make the usable size of this room bigger. Because there are some Sundays, I know this Sunday isn't an example, but there are some Sundays where we're getting towards the capacity of our seating. And if we took that down and made that the same floor level as this, moved this platform to the new middle of the room, we could make this room space larger. Did you notice that all of those sentences started with the word could? There's all sorts of options, and we need to hear from God what he is saying to us. We don't want to even begin embarking on this, uh, this idea unless God is leading us to it. There's lots more details I could tell you, but if you want all the details, really you do need to come to the church meetings because that's where we talk about it all in, in far more depth and detail. But we so need to hear from God. We so need to hear from God. If he is not in this then we will get ourselves into a bit of a mess if we start embarking on a building project. If he is in this, and if this is an idea that he's been dropping into people's minds, we've been thinking about it now for four or five years because we started thinking before lockdown and then it all got put on the back burner because of COVID, as you can imagine. Um, but if this is something that God has been speaking to us about over a period of time, then it will come together. We need to hear from God. And so... Uh, as a leadership team, we're asking the whole church to take three months as a season of prayer. And that's going to include three times when we come together and pray together. Uh, the first of which is today. There's going to be two evening prayer meetings. The dates were sent out in a letter last week. I'm afraid I can't remember them off the top of my head. There's also a prayer guide that Astrid has written, which I think went out in the email on Friday with the bulletin. So if you get the bulletin email, uh, that's, that's come out in that email. The original idea of that is that that could be something that small groups would use to, as a guide for praying together, but actually it would work just as well for praying individually. So please uh, 
get hold of that if you haven't. There's some printed copies on the welcome tables. Uh, that would be a, a useful thing to, uh, to keep with you over the next three months. But what we're going to do this morning, um, those of us that feel able, is we're going to pray around this building. Because I think there's something really significant about praying in the spaces where the action happens. And uh, you need to recognise that if you only come to TBC on a Sunday, and that's not said in a critical way at all, but if the only time you're in the building is on a Sunday, you only get to see one dimension of what TBC is. Because there is so much that happens on Monday through Saturday. There are so many other people that you've not met yet that are part of the TBC family who are here Monday through Saturday. There is so much that God is doing Monday through Saturday. Um, and I'd like us to spend some time praying in those spaces where some of those activities happen. So I've got, I don't know, you can see one or two of them just by turning your heads. You see the white piece of paper on that door over there. There's a load of those around the building and they've all got well, they're not all, there's some duplicates, but there's lots of different bits of information to guide your prayers. So there's a couple up there. There's a couple over there on those doors. There's a couple out on the windows of the corridor, out by the welcome table there. There's a few down at the far end of the corridor by that welcome table and around that area, sort of the, the back entrance hall. And there's a few around the walls in the big hall, what we call the Keatley Hall, the sports hall. And if you feel able, I'm going to encourage you, we're going to take probably 15 minutes when I stop uh, talking, to walk around the building and to pray in those areas for the different things that take place in those areas. If you don't feel able to move around, then please stay put and I'll bring you a piece of paper that's got all the same writing as those so you can pray where you are. The only thing I'm going to ask... Obviously, our children's and youth group are still taking place, and they have said, please ask everybody not to peer in through the windows and stand too close to the doors, because it will be incredibly disruptive. So the rooms we're not going into, obviously, are the rooms where the children are. Please don't crowd around the, uh, the Parker Hall door, the Thomas Room door, and the youth group are in the snug, um, because it will just be disruptive to them, and some of the kids will think that it's biscuit time and it's time to come out. So... Please try and stay away from those. And the most difficult thing I'm going to ask you, please keep the noise level at the level of a group of people praying. I've heard groups of people praying in the United Kingdom, and it is not a noisy business. Um, I wish it was, but it's not. Uh, so if we get into all chatting, then that, again, is going to be really disruptive to the kids. But if we're praying together... Get into groups and pray together in groups. Pray by yourself. Pray walking around. Pray however you like. But please pray and uh, spend some time doing that. What I haven't done yet, but will do as soon as I set you going, is I'm going to put some pens and paper on the communion table over there. If you feel that God says something to you, if you have a word or a picture or a leading of some way, in some way, then please write that down and drop it into one of the two collection boxes where, the, the, um, where we take the offering up. So there's one just over on that corner. Actually, it's, Jay, it's just been put up on top of the blue plastic box. If you could lift it down, that'd be perfect. Thank you very much. So there's one there, one on the table over there. Just fold it up and pop it in there, and that means it won't get lost. We'll get those together after the service. After 15 minutes, I'm going to call everyone back together. We're going to come back in here just for a final blessing and prayer before we go. But at that point, when I call everyone back together... If you have a child in the creche, that would be the right time to go and get them. And if you're part of the team that would normally go out during the last song to set up coffee, that's the time to do that because there is no last song. We're just going to be coming back in here for a prayer. Is there anything I should have said that I haven't said? No, I think I've probably covered it all. So we're going to pray. As I say, if you don't want to move around the room, stay around the building, stay put, and I will bring you a piece of paper. But let's take 15 minutes. I'm going to call us back together around about quarter two. Keep praying. We believe that God speaks. We, we don't believe in a God who leaves us by ourselves 
to work out what's the best, wisest way. We believe in a God who guides us and will continue to guide us as every step of the way. So please do continue praying over particularly these next three months because this is where we're, we're pausing the plans to take time to pray and hear from God. If you'd like to take, hold of a, um, take home a copy of what you've um, been reading around the walls, there's um, the sheets here. You're welcome to take one of those with you. Please do look at that, um, that prayer sheet that was sent round on Friday as well and use that as a guide over the next three months. Please do pray in your small groups, but please keep praying. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I, wish, I wish I could airlift you in to see and experience some of what God's doing here. I wish I could bring you here on a Friday night and stand you in the middle of this room when there's 70 kids running around the building at BFG. The energy and the excitement of it. I wish I could bring you into cafe on a Monday morning where there's 50 or 60 people, a whole load of families in the family room, and just to see the relationships and the connections that are being built up there. I wish I could show you the blessing that the food hub and frontline are to so many people through the week. We literally see hundreds of people in this building every week. And in different ways, God is meeting with them. It's not just people from TBC meeting with them. God is meeting with them. God is doing so much through the different ministries of this church. Please be praying. We don't yet know. If we knew we would be going ahead, we don't yet know whether this is the right thing or not. But we want so badly to hear from God. If he says, go ahead, then we will trust that he will provide, because there's a lot that needs to be provided if this building project is going to happen. So please, please pray with us over the next three months. And as and when you hear anything from God, nothing is insignificant because the thought that comes to you may just connect with a similar thought that's come to three other people. So please do write them down. Use the pieces of paper over there. Drop us an email, Astrid or myself, uh, or somebody else on the leadership team. But let us know where you feel that God is speaking, because together he will speak to us. So as we come to uh, close the service, I started off by reading those words from Romans. And as we go off into the week, may you know that there is nothing that can drive a wedge between you and God's love. May you know that there is no way that that can happen. That neither trouble, nor hard times, nor hatred, nor hunger, nor homelessness, nor bullying threats, nor backstabbing, nor even the worst sins in Scripture can come between you and the God who loves you. May you know that every morning as you wake up, every night as you go to sleep, and every moment in between this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, man. Just as we finish, um, please do stay around for coffee. I don't know whether the children's groups have finished quite yet, uh, but uh, the children and young people will be out in a moment. If you've come ready to put something into the offering, as I said earlier, the boxes are there and there, and the uh, contactless card machines are out by the welcome table there, and now attached to the wall um, down the corridor there if you want to give by card. There are not one but two evening services tonight. There's a 6.30 communion service, which is going to be taking place in the Thomas Room. And there's the 7.30 youth service encounter, which is going to be taking place in here. And next Sunday's service is all age. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there. If you've come wanting uh, to receive prayer for anything at all, then please do stay around at the end of the service. Perhaps take a seat down at the front here. And there's people that would love to pray with you after the service. Have a fantastic week.